The studio is in Salem, Massachusetts, which is uh, historically known as the Witch City because of the, uh, the witchcraft trials that took place here in what was it, the 1600s. Because of that, that history, it's become sort of a, a place that people interested in the occult have flocked to, as well as people, um, you know, Wiccan people, you know, earth-based earth religion people are, are uh, abound here. The Church of Satan actually set up shop here a few years ago, so that's interesting. Um, their, I think their national headquarters is here. This is a GCI. This is what I've been playing most live. Um, it's hard to tell, but it's actually a Wenge top and uh, pickups this new um, a Lawler DB, which I really like. It's super, super beefy, but also really articulate. Um, and this is, this is a GCI Craftsman. So this is my own design. And um, I hope to be able to actually get these things to the point where I can sell them, but I'm a little short on time lately. So, um, but I've been playing that live a lot lately. And I really like it. I'm 44 now. I've been playing in conversion since I was 17, so you know, more than more than half my life. And I was always the person, like the sort of technically minded person, who was tasked with like doing the recording or kind of interfacing with whatever studio we were working in. And um, so I got interested in recording through that. Yeah. What? Yes. Who's my cat? Who's my cat? All right. <laughs> So anyway, this is the apartment. Um, bands stay up here. You know, video games and couch and internet and stuff like that. So people have a place to uh, to go and they're not actively recording. And if they need a place to stay, they can stay here. I still play a lot of saxophone every once in a while. That like Joyce Manor record I just worked on, I played a little saxophone on that. I got started, and like a lot of people in school band, when you know I was like about ten years old, and. The typical story of like you know suburban kid who didn't have the internet in the 80s and you know didn't have much exposure to the outside world but i had the newsstand and the newsstand had thrasher magazine and thrasher had a couple people writing for it um mike gitter and jake phelps who are from marblehead massachusetts which is actually one town over from, from, from salem so things like boston hardcore were always represented in thrasher it turned me on to the idea that there was this like punk music scene happening really close to me that um, that was accessible to me, both in terms of like being able to go see the shows and being able to, to play that type of music. Got a degree in aerospace engineering, but I ended up working as a biomedical engineer for a bunch of years. And mid-summer of 2001, I found out I was getting laid off. My band Converge recorded an album called Jane Doe that was um, has become sort of a calling card record for us and really you know, kick things into high gear for us. But also just the, the kind of aggressive music scene that we were in just was growing a lot at that time. I think we were sort of poised to the right place at the right time to, to do well because of that. You know, when the dust settled, I found myself um, buying this building here in Salem. I no longer had a day job and I just started making records. So this Tom Tomas console gave me a lot of flexibility in terms of its modularity. Um, it sounds awesome. It sounds like an API kind of, but with, with more sweepable range to the EQs. And um, enabled me to build something that was small that would still fit between these two doorways that I have in the control room. Um, and let me do a lot of work, grab a lot of knobs without, without moving really far. And then these extra 16 channels of Tonelux over here, um, they're just kind of a placeholder right now. Um, I also have a Thermionic Culture Fat Bustard 14-channel uh, tube mixer that feeds into the stereo bus of this console as well. Presently, that um, that mixer is at my home studio. I have an analog mix rig at, at home as well, so when um, my assistants are working, recording stuff here, I can be mixing stuff at home. Um, what is up with that cat? I actually don't really know much of the backstory. I was at my friend Kelly's house and was like, Hey, what's up with that cat? And <laughs> and she was like, "Do you want it?" I was like, "Yeah," and so I got it. It's not real, but I call him Udo. 
Udo the Studio Panther. Another interesting tidbit, uh, when I need to listen to something on headphones, um, I listen to things on this Grado headphone amp, which was formerly owned by Steven Tyler of the uh, rock band Aerosmith. Um, if you're from Boston, you probably have an Aerosmith story. Dropkick Murphys is starting to replace Aerosmith in that sort of, in that way, but everybody's like, everybody around here is like, they're like cousins married to the bass player's sister, or, um, or like, oh, they used to come into our pizza shop all the time, they love this place, or like stuff like that. So, you know, like there's, a, there's an orange 4x12 out there that Aerosmith used to own. Um, but yeah, so if you're from around here, you end up with Aerosmith stories. Oh, wait, there, there we go. This is the sword that I made on a, on a, uh, on a belt sander, and uh, <laughs> my dad helped me weld it together when I was 10. I used to LARP in the woods a lot when I was a kid, so. This is my sword, and um, oh, and below that we have a uh, Sabian 30-inch ride cymbal. This is more of a conversation piece than a cymbal, but my friend, uh, my friend Nate had a drum shop that closed recently, and uh, I was able to like talk him out of this thing. My approach to gear collection, in theory, is based upon like collecting all the tools that I might need in my studio. Um, just so that it's on hand and ready to go when I need to use it. Um, you know, that being said, I like a lot of stuff and a lot of, <laughs> I mean, obviously like I like, I like collecting gear and I have a little bit of hoarder tendencies and having a studio is a bit of like a justification for my hoarder tendencies. Cause like, you know, quite frankly, like something has to sit unused for a pretty long time before I'm ready to purge it. Watch your heads. Well, let's go see, let's go see Zach. So, hey, how's it going? <laughs> so Zach's in here working on um, a trainer YBA, YBA 3A? YBA 3? No, just, oh, a, just three. a 3. Just okay. a 3, okay. Oh, a regular 3 had the fan? Regular 3 had the fan as well. Okay. Um, yeah, this is a, there's three of these in this building right now. <laughs> They're yeah. 130 watt tube amp from, this one's from 1968. Yeah. But, um, they're killer. I'm going to try to get him to fix my PV dirty my PV dirty dog at some point. I don't know what the what is wrong with this thing, but it's it's pretty crazy. PV like really like overbuilt a lot of stuff in a really gr good way. This is like no exception. I come from an engineering background. And my father was a machinist, and you know we'd always make his own things at home. And like a lot of my toys when I was a kid were handmade, and so I grew up like taking things apart. And I think a lot of other people. Uh, approach things differently where they're just much more instinctual or artistic about it and then applying sort of analysis to it after the fact is tedious to them whereas for me analyzing things is is how I make sense of them and I can you know sort of develop a system of you know algorithms and metrics and whatnot to figure out like why does that have emotional impact for me and if I know why that has in emotional impact for me in an analytical sense, then I might be a little better suited to, um, to get more emotional impact out of something else. So we build uh, God City Instruments pedals. Um, this one's one called Jugendstil, which is um, basically like a super heavy fuzz pedal that has um, the EQ borrowed from Boss HM2, just like a three, three gyrators. It's like a huge um, mid treble and, and bass boost with, with a giant chasm in the low mids in between the, in between the three. Um, and that's sort of set on full blast and then there's a parallel blend between EQ and no EQ which we call the loudness control. I also use that in the Brutalist Junior, which, which blends between a preset EQ and no EQ, which gives you sort of the, the feeling of more volume and more bass and treble when you, when you turn it up. So, so that's, a, that's a cool fuzz pedal. I haven't really been retailing my pedals too much yet because it's still like a fairly new thing for me, but I've been bringing stuff out on tour and selling it on the road. And um, so I've, I'm leaving for a European tour in a few days and I've got like, this is all a whole big box full of various pedals, um, prototypes, and short run builds, and things like that that I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring out with me. Um, right now I think it's fun to like bring my experiments out on the road, um, get some feedback from people, but also like, you know, every one of these is different somehow. So the stuff that's getting out there now 
if you, if you get one of those, you're going to have something that's really unique. I have a lot of regrets about missing out on a lot of live shows that I could have seen because I was always more concerned with creating my own music. If I had to like weigh like, you know, Flanger versus going to a show and buying a t-shirt, like Flanger would always win. Secret weapons in here. Okay, um, let me take a look here. Um, well, actually, I know I know this is. I don't, I don't mean to be like earthquake or earthquake or earthquake, but this pedal's really good. Um, I just got this, and I also just recorded Joyce Manor, and this is like all of the new Joyce Manor record. So that's that's a cool thing to have. Um, this is actually the first GCI pedal, which is my company. That's um, this one's called the Strange Rooster, but it's basically like a, a range master with a tweakable uh, with a with a sweepable. Um, cap blend at the input so you have a, a wide range of you know bright to dark kind of tonal tonal shaping but this is just like a nice pedal for mating guitar to amp you know if you need if the guitar needs to be a little hotter or brighter or darker or something to, to play nice with whatever amp you're using this is like the perfect interface kind of pedal this is a secret weapon i actually lost my original one so this is a newer one um but the boss os2 this is like all all the bands from around me growing up in the uh the merrimack valley hardcore scene Bands like Converge and Cave In and, and Piebald were all like strong proponents of the Boss OS2. And we would just like, we'd roll the color, the, this thing has like a color mix that goes between OD1 and DS1. Um, so we would roll the color all the way to the OD1 side, just a little bit of drive, tone usually most of the way down, and then, and then use it as a boost. So this would kind of starve the bottom end, which we, we all had like older kind of crappy tube amps. And, um, but we all played like pretty high gain stuff. So if we wanted to play high gain stuff out of it, we had to star the bottom end a little bit to tight, tighten up the amp. And this was a great pedal for doing that. This is um, this is a GCI Brutalist Junior, which is um, my business card. Uh, which I have a business card that is um, a PCB that can be turned into a distortion pedal. Um, and the card looks like this sticker here. So um, this is this is one that I built that has um, a few mods. There's, there's a a, uh, I was changed around a, f a few values. I also added like a tone stack bypass and um, three different clipping modes. Ooh, this pedal. If I'm doing a guitar solo, this is probably on there. The Fox Rocks Octron 2. I recently got an Octron 3 for my board, which is um, a small, this basically the same circuit, just in a smaller package. This one has separate bypass for each octave, but like it does like, it's basically like an Octavia and a blue box. Um, in one pedal. So you get octave octave up and octave down at the same time. For leads, this thing, or also for like keyboardy sounding bass, this thing just rips. With pedals, I think, especially like the more, the more esoteric the pedal is, the more the song needs to be written with the specific pedal in mind. You know, it's not like um, somebody comes in and I just like put an arpenoid in front of them or like a Korg Miku and they're like, oh, that's it. That riff that I wrote six months ago is now perfect with the arpenoid, you know, like, so, but I might throw an arpenoid in front of them for fun and they might be messing around and be like, ooh, this gives me an idea for the next record. Almost every band that I record leaves my studio with a shopping list. You know, the last full band that I recorded was Joyce Manor and those guys don't use pedals at all. And now I think they, they all need to go out and buy Westwoods and, um, I think we used the Source Nemesis and the Dispatch Master on, um, on a lot of stuff. So yeah, so those guys have a shopping list and it's really gonna affect their next record. So this orange OR80 right here, I've actually been lusting after this, this actual amp for 20, 25 years. And then here's an orange 4x12 that Zach actually owns now, but was formerly owned by Aerosmith. It's like a weird shallow orange 4x12, but it, Something about like the shallow depth just makes it like really mid forward and super throaty. So I like that. Um, I like that cabinet a lot. I've got two Marshall four by twelve cabs. There's the the, the slant cab is a uh, model 1982, which was like the heavy duty version of the 1960, and that has roll of E30s in it. And the bottom cab is one of the newer hand wired um, 1960 BHWs. And that has some Eminence um, Wizards and Eminence Hemp Dogs in it. So that's a real, real stony cab. So over here we have a Varelin Nifty 150, which is like a 150 watt version of his 
meat smoke base head. This thing is really great, super clean, super clear, really punchy. Below that, we have a Gibson Titan stack. This, this amp is kind of a secret weapon of mine, takes pedals really well, especially dirt pedals. Um, it's loud, it's over the top, but it's also like controllable with a really, um, with a super useful EQ. Well, music is my job, but music's also my hobby. So I'm really interested in all the aspects of, um, of music creation, uh, uh, particularly in how um, a new tool can inspire a new, a new artistic creation. Like when you get a new guitar and you think it looks badass, like you're more inspired to play that guitar than maybe some guitar you've had for a long time that you're really accustomed to, even if you like that guitar better and play it better. So like when I get a new pedal, I'm like, oh wow, I gotta figure out what this thing does and you know, spend all of this time like getting lost, tweaking knobs, learning the pedal, but maybe in that process, you come up with a new riff, and that new riff becomes a new song, and then that song takes on a life of its own, and that is a really an amazing feeling. So by creating my own equipment, um, it helps me get inspired to write music, um, and I hope that it also helps inspire other people to create music.